back to Masters Modern. I am your host, Alex Kessler, here with my co-host, Ben Bateman. And today, uh, this is part two of our discussion about the bannings that happened last week. This is about the bannings in Pioneer and the unbannings uh, as well, as we're going to be talking about some cool stuff in regards to uh, Ravnica Remastered, Remastered sets in general, and what they mean. Uh, also, if you haven't hit that like and subscribe button. Also, if you haven't hit that like and subscribe button, make sure to hit those below. Um, and please comment with what card you're, which deck you're most excited to play about in Pioneer. And last but not least, we have a new game come, that has came out this season called Spy X Family, uh, Mission for Peanuts. If you are familiar with the anime, uh, it's uh, about collecting the perfect mission to go on a team to get as many peanut points as possible. Uh, you can uh, Each of the different cards have different powers and abilities as you discard them or play them as your role. And you're looking to try and be the last person standing uh, or the person with the best team possible at the end of the game. Uh, you can check out more information at it uh at cast.co uh or castentertainment.com or uh castentertainment.co or go to uh barnesandnoble.com and look for spikes family mission for peanuts thank you so much and uh excited for this episode to get started welcome to the masters of modern uh the other one, one thing to bring up is just as far as pioneer goes like a bunch of other bands that happened they banned karn um they unbanned thopter um a smuggler copter they banned um monastery swift spear and popper there's was there another card in popper uh pioneer no. those been no okay those, uh, those uh, are the uh, main yeah, bands yeah. Yeah. Oh, in pioneer there was that there was that card from oh the uh, discover card the disco yeah. the the cascade the four mana cascade but discovery uh card was also banned so i think i think sorry and i i am remembering the timeline of beans being banned uh to when it came out is not was not the card that was so quick it was specifically uh the discovery card that uh was the one of the quickest bannings in history it has to be in the top five quickest bands like it's not it's not lutri levels of quickest bands and it's not um uh memory jar levels of quickest bands both of which were banned before packs were opened <laughs> um but I definitely, I think it has to be in the top five, if not. The card like, you were talking about is Geological Appraiser, correct? Yeah, Geological Appraiser, which is a four mana, three, three, that has basically Cascade three. It's Discover three, um, and they it's were basic, using it. It's, it's effectively monocolored Bloodbraid Elf. I mean, almost. It's It feels a lot like it. It doesn't have haste, but if you read the card and you go back into modern days of yore, it, it is very similar. It's like, it's, it's as close to Bloodbraid Elf as we have seen printed since, and Unsurprisingly, what, what's, the, what's the discover cost on it? It's it's discover three, right? Yeah. So it, it basically it was using it to and clones because because discover is an ETB, it's not a cast trigger. It no longer like you can now cascade into cascade. You can if you discover into a clone that then clones itself to then discover to you can chain them into themselves. So on turn four, you would just have an army of creatures in play. And it was playing that and Quintorius and other ones to just like generate so much value that it win. That deck's probably not dead because Quintorius and the big dinosaur is still there and there are other discover cards, but it definitely took a hit by getting rid of this. Um, and then uh, Karn the Great Creator, I think is just like, I think Karn the Great Creator is up there on my list of cards that just were mistakes. Sure. <laughs> yeah, like this card agree. has done nothing but make on like it's it's and it's more egregious than Teferi ever was because of the fact that it is an unfun card due to its artifact hating. And then also it's like, I can tutor for any artifact ever printed um, and it doesn't even have to be in my main deck. It's a wish is just like d d has on fun. I'm not surprised it was banned. I think the biggest comment that we've seen that's been the funniest has been just like tr mono green Tron, which is the reason the card was banned was on like a, a downswing. Like the discovery deck was beating it up. Um, to me, it feels like they knew that and they knew that the discovery deck was good against mono green Tron but they planned on getting rid of the discovery deck because they didn't like what that play pattern was. It's not the intent and they didn't want this mechanic to have like the bad taste in people's mouths of it ruining pioneer for so long. But same as by getting rid of fury, you knew beans was just going to be the best deck. If you got rid of the new discovery deck, you knew that mono green Tron was just going to be miserable again to play against. So get rid of both. Um, and then to, to, to on top of that unbanning smugglers copter, a card that is um, classically good at, at powering decks that are good against the two decks we just described or other decks like them, like uh, makes the deck format more interesting. I'm actually pretty excited for Smuggler Copter. I, I own four Battle Bus. The I don't I don't even like Fortnite that much, but I think it's just hilarious that there's Fortnite. Like you can fly a bus, alter art, secret layer version of it. So excited to jam some Pioneer and and the the Pioneer de deck I have is Grease Fang. So I'm excited for some Smuggler Copter Grease Fang shenanigans going into uh the next the new year. 
I mean, Copter is one of my favorite cards of all time. I'd probably put it in my top 25. I love it so much. It's like a card that I feel like every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, I should be able to find a way to like take advantage of this more. It does so many things I like. It has draw discard. It's a three power or more flyer. It wants me to play like one power creatures. It's just like so good. <laughs> um, and it's always felt to me like it's really powerful, but it's not like so oppressive that it ever felt justified that it was banned. I mean, I, I, I know the people that make those decisions are smarter than me, so I will allow that to happen. But I'm so happy when it's back being legal into formats that I like. Um, and it's also a card that I'm surprised has not seen as many reprintings. You know, it's it's now been almost, I think, like 10 years, nine, 10 years since it was first printed. And I think we've seen like it and like maybe like a Kamigawa commander deck and a secret layer or something. Like, I think that's it. I can look at uh, Smuggler's Cop. But, but 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 ironically, like if you talked to me three years ago and you talked about a card from that time period and there had been three printings, that would have seemed totally normal. It's just the by today's standard, there should be like twelve. Like well, yeah, card, I think I think card has like I, seventeen printings now. I think part of it also is that like Smuggler's Copter is a weird card because it is either the best card in the format or Stone Cold unplayable. There's been six printings. Well, there's been one, six. two. There's there's smuggler copter from Kaladesh. There's a smuggler copter from Kamigawa's uh, commander deck. Yep. There's a uh, promo th- that's the, and then there's two. There's a secret layer. So there's been three printings. You're right. Okay. So, so that's commander deck, secret layer, and the original. That's what I thought. I mean, that's about right. I wish that was kind of the standard nowadays. In ten years, you get three of something, and one was a if if one was a secret layer. If you would give me one standard printing, one commander printing, and a secret layer in 10 years, magic would be in a wonderful place when it comes to reprint equity. I wish that was the case, as opposed to, I feel like when I look up a lot of cards I like, where it's like, oh, this is the 13th printing of this card. And like five of them have been in the last six years. That's, I mean, you know, obviously there's a version of every card for every player, and some of them are way, 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 way less common. So it's not like, every printing affects the sort of availability of a card. It just, it, I want it to be exciting. I guess is the point when cards get announced for reprint. That's the point. I want it to be like this card that we all love that when we see in each other's trade binders and you play, I'm like, Oh cool that you have this thing, right? You got it. Cause you played in the format. I want one of those, but I don't really want to get it yet. Oh, it got announced as a reprint. So sick. I'm going to buy the set so I can open one. That's like how I want it to feel. Whereas I feel like it often feels like, Oh, cool. It got announced as a reprint for the second time this year. Okay. I don't need to care because it'll get reprinted again. That 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 will happen. Like that's that's the one thing I wish that the 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 uh, product design team would pay attention to. It seems like they aren't talking to each other. Like 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 for instance, obviously we have upcoming this clue product and we have the uh, Ravnica remastered product and murders at Karloff Manor. And I know for a fact that clue and also that the, uh, remaster product will both have shocks. Now I don't think shocks have been confirmed for murders. I don't know if they will be, but two out of three products being released within one month of one another will have shock lands in them. That's like a very cool thing that magic does. I, I, I wish that there weren't multiple retail products with shock lands happening so fast it just I think the good news is that shocklands will be cheap, right? Like I think we've often said that we wish that lands weren't the main gate to be able to play formats and if between that and Modern Horizons 3 maybe having the enemy color or the ally color fetch lands like the mana base of modern becomes massively more accessible. I don't hate that. And like obviously other lands are going to be expensive like triumphs are now going to be super expensive or whatever. I I do agree that it makes like if the shock lands were supposed to be the exciting feature of the clue product, and that was supposed to convince me to buy the clue product, I'm less likely to. On the other hand, if it is like a weird, cool clue themed draft board game format, that actually sounds super sick to me. So maybe on the other hand, I'm maybe just excited to buy that once on its own. We, we kind of mentioned at the beginning. I also think that clue product is like, that's a get this into Walmart and target as a board game through like Hasbro corporate type of product right like it's it's the the um not unstable what was the un 
Oh, unstable, right? What was the what was the, the weird boxed unset? It wasn't. Un- it was the one with Alexander Clamilton. Un unsanctioned. Un unsanctioned. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's it's like unsanctioned was made, right? It's it's how to make Magic the Gathering the board game, right? Where like, and you've heard this with battle bosses, right? Like a lot of people are like, wait, I want for retail. We don't want the specialty. Let carrot people customize it, build the community around it. We want like a mom to come in and buy a board game, and I think the clue. A clue game based on their most popular plane, taking clue, a welcome, like a very well known Hasbro brand, Ravnica, the most popular Rav- uh, magic brand, and combining them into a magic product that has cool promos that some people will want those versions of is meant to be sold at Target. It I would, I would say, like I, product. I would say your point is totally on the nose. I think the idea is that that mom doesn't know she's buying Fetchlands. And I think the point, or sorry, Shocklands. And I think the point is there's no need to make them available in that product if you're going to make them available in a different product available at retail within a month, because I agree with you. I actually think that that's one of the cooler announcements lately. I want products like that to exist. I don't want the regular collector who wants EV in their, in their purchase to look at the clue thing and be like, hey, I need to get my dollars here. I want them to look at that and go, this is dope. I watched Clue in you know, 1985 or grew, you know, grew up watching it with my family. And I want to buy this because I love magic and I want these cool cards. I mean, I saw previews all week on Twitter about all the various commanders in the Clue set. And like, there's very cool stuff in there. It looks like a great set. I think it's going to sell itself. I think that's the point is like, I just want there to be the same sort of consistency with community excitement regarding reprints. I, it makes it it makes it hard as a creator to stay excited in the same way because it makes me feel like I don't have to get excited anymore when certain things get reprinted because I'm like, they'll just get reprinted again soon within the next year. And that's the difference. Yeah, I will have a different opinion once we see all of Ravnica Remastered, which is like previous seasons about to start, right? Yep. And we get an idea of where the value is lying across cards across the board. I'll have a different opinion depending on what that is for for the value of Shocklands between the two four, right? Like if there's a lot of va- if like every heater from Ravnica ever is in there, and we're getting loam and cool dredge cards, and we're getting cool, um, we're getting abrupt decay and assassins trophy. You know, like there's there's a lot of good cards that could be in those sets. I don't know how much they're worth from a value perspective collectively, but, yeah, but excitement, but excitement is excitement. Yeah. I mean, dark Confidant, yeah, yeah. like hard like people like. There, there's another like there's another point that Wizards is kind of leaning, I think, more into like they're selling that the draft. Right. Like the, the the remastered sets especially are like no longer being sold on the basis of like we're selling a product that the point of this is to be get value out of it. So. Like they're almost taking the we don't acknowledge the secondary market piece to heart and in a way they're doing it in a way that makes it more affordable. I, I'm interested to see how they two balance out each other. Like I think they have different markets, so we'll see. Um, but the I other hand, if it just if, if their goal is to just make Shocklands dirt cheap, like get get like the, them to be uh, no longer a thing that's gatekeeping formats, I think that's also positive. I will say I'm pretty darn excited to draft Ravnica Remastered. Like same as a as a longtime player who has lived through each of the different Ravnicas and loves the multicolored format and like just that's like so core to my heart. And is it? was literally created in the first Ravnica. Like there are so many cards I love. I'm very excited to draft. That's a, that's a huge thing for me. So I I can't wait for that. Agreed. I'm, I'm really hyped. Yeah. Like it, like just like, like the, idea, just describing it, the, the idea of getting able to play like the different three different variants of Golgari together, like getting to play dredge with scavenge with what they were doing in Ravnica, uh, in in guilds of Rav- whatever the third set was or or getting to play all three versions of is it or get like the mechanics getting to see how they interact with each yeah. other is gonna be really yeah, fun like, like getting to play like electrolyze off goblin electromancer when i draw like a, a like a jump start spell is gonna be like a lot for me becoming like, a like yeah. and i'm gonna I'm, i'll have like drafted like one of the niv mizzets or something as my bomb like i mean come on like you're even really even cool. just like like orza like yeah i'm i'm pretty hyped actually like the Ravnica Limited is really fun and like it all will work together really well. I'm interested to see how they balance 10 guilds in one set. But other than that, I think it's going to be a blast. And, and I've been a big proponent that I think they should get rid of master sets and lean into remastered sets. I agree. Like I'm yeah. more excited about like I don't care if the value of a box of 
of uh, Ravnica remasters isn't good if the limited format is like classic Ravnica feeling limited, right? Because like I, there are limited formats that I would pay good money for just to play the limited format again and not keep the cards. Not like if I get to keep the cards, I'd pay more. But like, you know, I would I would love to do that. So I'm yeah. I'm really excited. It's because it's because I mean, we talked about this once before, but now that the months have passed, probably more than once, actually, I really believe that that opinion we share of no more master sets is the future. Cause I think yeah. that if you were to spread all of those reprints across remastered sets, and then you put the sort of mystical archive, you know, uh, retro artifact, whatever you want to call it, right. That sheet, the bonus sheet in most sets. And even if you do serialize cards in one set, and you do like a one of one in a different set. And like, if you choose set to set what you're going to do, and every set has like a cool bonus, you can probably make every single standard set feel exciting. It feels like almost like master sets invalidate the excitement of standard sets. That's the point. Like it feels like there's no need to do it because you can just spread that jazz across all of these standard sets and get the same pop. And yep. ultimately what we saw now in the last 10 years is that master sets from days past, once reprints happen enough times, those packs from those sets the secondary market, which, you know, obviously they don't acknowledge, we can talk about drops drastically. The cards are no longer expensive that you can open from those sets because they've been reprinted so many times. So the point of a master set almost like loses its point, like a reprint set that doesn't have useful reprints anymore is like, why, why did this ever exist? Well, and, done- and like, and in, and in those cases, for a long time, there was a conversation like, oh, the limited is very good. But people would argue, oh, but they shouldn't make it limited. Like it's too expensive for limited to be there. Like, it, and it's too hard for me to get under an understanding. Is this limited environment good? Right. If I only get to draft Modern Masters one once ever, how good is the limited actually? Versus looking at something like a remastered set, where even if it is a little bit premium, I know what Ravnica Limited is like. I know what an Innistrad limited environment is supposed to look like. And I love those. Lim- so they're like you're selling me not necessarily on card value, but on like format nostalgia. Like I would tomorrow buy multiple boxes if they did just straight up Innistrad one remastered, which they're kind of doing right. We're about to get cons block remastered. Um, not, there's not even, sorry, that's not even true. We're about to get just cons cons of Tarkir is being released on uh, arena. arena next week and it is not cons remastered it's not cons block it's not like f- car- cool cards from fate reforms and dragons are to it's literally just the set cards of tark here and i guarantee it's going to do gangbusters it's going to be sick i'm so excited for that and and it's because like that format's good if they just reprinted innistrad tomorrow just like innistrad remastered the original set maybe they like they get rid of invisible stalker or get rid of Butcher's no, Cleaver. You gotta, you gotta give me Invisible Stalker, man. I love well, Invisible maybe, Stalker. Maybe get, maybe get rid of Butcher's Cleaver, right? Butcher's Cleaver, like, you, there's other things. You can put the two plus two flying enchantment on Invisible Stalker. That's still insane. Like, you're making a 3-3. Three, three. Oh, you can put I, the dagger. I, literally, literally, I won, I, won, I won so many games in that limited. The I drafted Innistrad at MDG Summit last year, and I won a bunch of games off of having just the dagger. Not the Butcher's Cleaver, just the little dagger on Invisible Stalker. So you can still have Invisible Stalker, but get rid of Butcher's Cleaver. Right? Like, if you want to do, like, a tweak. But even then, maybe just print it straight up, as you just uh, said. I'd want, just straight to, up I, I, I'd want to be able to bonus out and just get Stalker Cleaver. I love it. Okay, just print it. I'm, that's what I'm <laughs> saying. Like, just print Innistrad. Yeah. Re, yeah. Like, you don't have to do zero with, like, cool art treatments, right? That's all you need to do. Yeah. It's just, like, in each pack, there's a cool art. And... There you go. Now, now we just, and people would, I would pay real money to be, I pay $200 a box, like, you know, premium, premium box quality, not like commander mat, whatever this last year thing was the double masters prices, but I would pay like step up prices to, to do that for sure. And I think other people would, I think like, yeah, I think that the community at large and we can, we can end on this because I know we're, we're a bit long tonight, but like, I think the community at large agrees with what we're saying which is i think there's a there's a dearth of product i think there's a lot of reprints i think people love their classic formats and i think that people really genuinely appreciate the ingenuity in standard sets i think it's not it's not different than it's ever been and i would argue that there's there's greater minds 
focusing harder on trying to make great standard sets now than there ever have been. Like we really have people who are like strategy scientists with cards looking at this and saying like, I love this game. I've always loved it. I want to make the best set possible. The thing, the biggest thing right now that is the roadblock for magic's growth and for like the retention of the classic audience is just understanding how people want to view the, the value of the thing they spend money on. And it, to me, it feels solvable. It just feels like the last couple of years, there's been a, a major focus on we're going to spend money to buy things that may, but probably won't maintain the value we're spending. And there's a better way to stretch that across all products. There's probably one too many sets a year, maybe like ish, maybe two at most. But like, it doesn't feel like we're that far ahead of where we ever were. What it actually feels like is the distribution of reprints could be better spent across interesting sets like we're seeing with reprints. I don't even care about serialized. To be honest with you, it, like I've, I've never opened a serialized card in my life. I've never opened one in a pack ever. Have you? No. Yeah. Like, I don't even care. Like, it's cool to me that I that, like there's there's going to be a Steam Vents serialized one of one. Like someday in my life, I hope I can w- win the lottery or find myself in such crazy position that I could get that card because it would be so cool to me to have it. But like, honestly, the guy that gets it good for him. I don't care. Like what I actually care about is the fact that like I can get the experience I want out of playing magic. And I don't mind that there's an expensive card that makes a regular Steam Vents cheaper. What I do mind is that when they sell me an expensive product, like a really expensive product and I buy it, it doesn't feel like it's worth what I'm paying. I don't care if my regular price product isn't worth that much. I care when I spend $25 a pack. That's what I care about. I wish that there was a better way for those expensive products to have some long-term value. That's the thing that I think I hope adjusts in the consumer's favor over time, because I think that's the number one problem that consumers are going to have over time. Yeah. I, I, one thing I think that's also interesting, and this will be my last thing, <laughs> going into with cons releasing the way it's releasing on Arena and Ravnica releasing as a remastered set immediately afterwards. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm interested to see like, like what's better, right? Going to rent Star Wars, like or, or watching the original Star Wars as George Lucas made it or watching the re-released DVD Blu-ray version, right? So like, like if if and this goes back to your your point on Invisible Stalker, right? Like, <clears throat> Constant Stalker is going to come out and we're all going to play it, and it's going to be exactly what it was before. All the same cards, same distribution of things. You get to play this format on Arena, or or and or they're going to also have this Ravnica remaster set, which is kind of a different. It's not any of the Ravnicas. We're not playing Return to Ravnica again. We're not playing original Ravnica block. It's its own little thing. And is the re, like. All of the designers with hindsight getting to retouch cards, changing which cards are there, building the limited environment based on lessons learned going to be better. You know, George Lucas realizing, oh, special effects are way better now. I can add Windows to Cloud City, but also a musical number in the middle Rito of the should shoot first. Oh, you know, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Han Solo is a hero. He would never shoot first. Uh, and and or is it just with the original sets being coming up better? And, and I think like it's going to be an, it's going to be an interesting comparison uh cuz i think like your point you could re-release Innistrad tomorrow do you include invisible stalker i know that there are wizards employees that we're friends with that have talked about how that's their biggest mistake in the set that they don't think invisible stalker should exist that that's what makes Innistrad not a top 1 draft format of, of all time but you're playing with you know fire like if you get rid of that does that remove a little bit of one of the features does that make blue red just that much worse and no longer as fun in the format? Or does it cut out the viability of being able to fight against spider spawning? Like, does it change whatever balance existed in Innistrad that ended up being this perfect amalgamation? And you don't know until you come out with it, but should, is it worth that change? Is it worth making that update to maybe make something that's not as good in the end? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that in general, <clears throat> I believe we can all learn hindsight is 2020. You can try to adjust, but when it comes to creation and art, specifically creativity, I almost think retrospectively, nothing should ever be changed. I think it's like the same conversation. (laughs) I I, I think it's the same conversation. If you were going to talk about like, Hey, this great album by this great artist had a track that at the time the artist said something offensive and it's like, Oh, well on the re-release, we should ban it. It's like, no, that's the way that like, it's a piece of history. 
You don't have to agree with it. It doesn't have to make the artist look better. But they said this horrible thing on this track. It's not a testament to what's right or wrong. It's like this is a piece of history that was said and written and recorded. And the people who understand this artist should judge that artist based on the track for better or for worse. You shouldn't act like because you can go back and and, and be like, well, the world's changed. We want this to be different. It's the same thing. There's a reason that that album or that track of that artist was regarded in that time that way, right? The same way that Innistrad, we loved it. It was arguably the best draft format of all time for you and I. Do you really think that one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful thing you could do in that format is a reason that we didn't like it? Like I played it and, and and won with it a lot. Like if that hadn't been in the format, I might not have liked it as much. I I think sure. I think that changing things like that because we think we know better now is foolish. I I I would say, unless you're specifically hurting someone or people or something, don't do things like that. Respect the fact that something had made an impact, like a significant historical impact. And if you're going to go back to it, re-release it the same way. That's that would be my opinion. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because one of the reasons I bring it up is for for Innistrad specifically is Innistrad's not worth anything anymore, right? A box of Innistrad costs like five hundred dollars, but the cards inside of it are worth nothing. And to yeah. your point, you and, open, and so you can open ten foil Liliana of the Veils and still lose money, right? Exactly. So, like, <laughs> if that's currently the case, just reprint Innistrad. There's no longer a reserved list reason to you know, or like a, a maintaining the value of collections to not reprint it as is. So, why just reprint it? Yeah, I would buy it. <laughs> I disagree. Give me, give me, give me some sort of remastered set. I, I, I still want pack foils to be. You just said foils. don't change it. You just said don't remaster it. You just said just print it as is. You made a long oh, argument give, of that you wouldn't give delete me a visible. A multiple, like, give, give me like you're doing with like 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 or like Ravnica. Like Ravnica remasters multiple sets. Give me multiple well, but, sets. But like, is Innistrad? Would you say any amalgamation of Innistrad sets is better than just OG Innistrad by itself? No, because Innistrad, 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 Dark Ascension was worse. Right, like together, that is worse than Innistrad by itself. Shadows okay. over Innistrad, worse <laughs> than original Innistrad. Shadows Innistrad plus is, Spoon, worse than original Innistrad. We have a lot of market research and data that tells us that classic magic packs that exist from old formats are a cool, special, vintage thing. If you just start reprinting them, I think it gets weird. I think you start to dilute a lot of the sort of. I, there's a collectability to Why? old magic. I, you, there's a there's a way you not can anymore. do it. There's no value in the pack. Like buying an Innistrad pack is no, is only worth it for the draft. I'm not paying five hundred dollars to draft once. Owning no an Innistrad in the pack. pack, owning an Innistrad pack from like that time period is something special. Like just drafting the original Innistrad with you and our friends, like that is actually from that time. That's not standard. I would much rather my son get to play Innistrad for a month straight with his friends for the first time. <laughs> Ash will never play in Innistrad. If name I name, name one piece of art. Name one piece of art that plays that way. Like name, like any an album. Would you say that like, no, you know what? The Beatles, that was a time for the 60s. If you're lucky enough to have one copy of a Beatles, disposable Beatles album that erases itself after one listen, you're, you know, that you want to hold that on your mouth, not listen to it, just have it in a closet that you get to like own the 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 record label that burns itself once you oh, listen a re- to it. Look, look, a reissue, a remaster, non-first edition, something that denotes that it's not the original, that's fine. If you want to sell if you want to sell me yeah, it'll, it'll have diff- all the arts different. All the borders are new border or have weird cool little Innistrad remaster stamped on them. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that that no no problem at all. You said reprint. I thought you said just reprint Innistrad like you can make the packs look different, but the cards and the distribution of rarity and what cards are included are all exactly the same. Yeah. I mean, I, okay. I'll go with you on that one, but I still, I still feel like if they were going to go through the trouble of reprinting the original Innistrad, there would be something, there'd be like a, a bonus sheet. There'd be something fancy. That's what they would do. You just know that. But that makes it worse. Even if it's not playable, like a collectible, a collectible thing that sells the set, you know, there would be like cool. Yeah. The basic lands could be cool. All the basic lands have cool Innistrad artwork. They're all black and white, and you can't tell which color they are. <laughs> all right. Like uh, that's we're gonna, please, <laughs> please, if you like this episode, hit the like and subscribe button. We come out with new episodes at least once a month, uh, but, but in tons of shorts and other content, and we're doing story recaps. One thing that we are going to be doing uh, for Murders of Karlov Manor is we're bringing back the story uh, recaps that I was doing for uh, March Machines and All Will Be One. So uh, we're really excited about that coming out. Um, and we already posted the first one. You can check it out right now. It's on the channel. Just look for the single mono color with white text uh, thumbnail. Uh, make sure also follow us on TikTok, both the Masters of Modern TikTok 
as well as Kess Wiley TikTok. And then uh, make sure to follow us on Twitter and check out all of the fun stuff coming out with this set and all the future sets. And we are excited uh, to uh, see you next week. And I can see Whitney poking through the door behind you. Hello, Whitney. I'm waving at her. It's so cute. Uh, yes, we are, we are excited to uh, see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, look forward to wrapping up. Bye, guys. All right. Bye, everybody.